Hi folks, Mickey here from Twas Such Daring Outdoors Adventures. Now today in this video I want to talk about brimstone matches. Now I know our younger generation won't really know what them are. Well brimstone matches was basically a homemade match that they used to make in the 18th century. They'd use it to uh, help get a fire going, uh, like candles, you know. In the olden days, you would have the cot next to the mother's bed, and if the baby would cry, you know, the mother would get up to see the baby, but, you know, middle of the night, so she would light a brimstone match. Now, the way you light a brimstone match is you use a tinderbox, you know, flint and steel. You get an ember on some charred material, could be anything, cloth, uh, you know, plant material, dried and what have you. And then you would touch this match to this ember and it would light. And they actually used to sell them on the streets in the 18th century. You would have the match sellers and they would have the matches fanned out in their hands. And you would like buy three packs for a penny, something like that, you know. But they were used traditionally in bushcraft as well to, you know, light the fires and things like that. So, how do you make a brimstone match? Well, all you need is some sulphur, something to melt the sulphur in, like a, I don't know, a little, a little pan or something. I'm using it on uh, top of a, a beer can. Some fire lighters. Some sticks and really that's about it the sulfur you can buy from Amazon eBay and it's sulfur ground powder 400 grams of it um, as I say it's, you can buy it anywhere really it's, it's quite popular so so then what you would do is you would get your Sticks. Now in the olden days they would, they would just use a splinter of a uh, piece of wood and they would sharpen each end at an angle. So really that's all you need. So we'll get these out of the way and I'll show you how to make them. Right I've got a piece of old wood here just so I don't get any of the sulphur on the table. And what you want to do is you get your sulphur. You don't need loads. Just, just a little bit like that. A little bit more. Right. Candles. I'm going to light the candle, and then we're going to place this all like that. Now the thing is, try not to breathe in the fumes because they are irritant to the the throat and the lungs. But as you can see, it's just starting to melt. Right, as you can see it's melted, so you will get your stick and you would literally soak on the end of the stick with the melted sulphur. There's one. Put the side to dry. Two. Put somewhere to dry. Three. Right, so this is your steel, this is your flint, and that is your charred material. It could be uh, cotton, 
you know, cotton cloth or some kind of vegetation. This is actually a um, uh, cattail. You know the fluff? It's charred cattail. Right folks, finally in camp, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut some wood, get my bed sorted and I might get the fire on because I really fancy a nice bacon sauna. So I'm going to love you and leave you while I cut some wood. Okie dokie. Got my bed sorted now. The wind's picked up, which I need to keep an eye on because there's a lot of leaning trees and there's a few moving around. I've cut a load of wood, so that should uh, keep us going through the night. But what I thought I'd do now, before I show you the uh, the tinder box. I thought I'd show you some of my kit that I use. Now this is a hammock chair. I got it from a bloke who made them. And his company was called, oh look up here, here and then, hammocks. www.ukhammocks.co.uk I don't think that website's running anymore. I don't know if he's producing these anymore, but what I'm thinking about doing is making some myself and putting them on the website. If you haven't seen my website, um, go to the link uh, below. Uh, try such daring outdoors. The link's below, so check that out. It's just a website that I've started up, or you can click on the, the bottom corner, it's got me the like on from the website there. So this is just a piece of material tied at each end into a hammock style. You can have it as a hammock chair or as a mini hammock. So I'll show you what it looks like as a mini hammock. Right, it's just tied to two trees. I would have preferred the trees a little bit further away, like apart, but I can't find any at the moment. So, what I like to do is get my leg out. And then just lean yourself into it. And it is literally just like a hammock. There you go. Oh. Well, you can sit there this way, you know, if you wanted. Or put the feet up like this. Or if you wanted, you could just sit in it like this. So, but the other way you can um, set it up is using a tripod. So I'm going to show you that now. Right, first of all, you want to make a tripod. It's got to be nice and strong because it's, it's going to take your weight. And then you need a pole for the bottom. It goes on like this. So what you do is you wrap the hammock round the pole and then you've got to adjust it just to get it right so I would see it round about there yep, you see it up there and then you tie the two ends at the top Yeah. 
There you go. That's the hammock chair. Oh. And it's so comfortable. Oh. You can adjust it any which way you want. You can have it higher, you can have it lower, you can have it lie back. All you do is put the, this back part of the tripod down, like so. Make sure it digs in the ground because you don't want it flattening out. And then just adjust it again. Oh. And that way you can just relax. And look up the stars at night in front of the fire. So yeah, this is a hammock chair. Another piece of kit that I always bring is my saw. And I've put my glasses on. It is a Samurai C330LH saw. Comes in a tough sheath and you get the buckle that goes on the belt. I haven't brought my belt to here. But uh, basically you just get the clip, push it in, the clips onto your belt. <laughs> I've cut arc irons with this and it just it glides through the wood like butter. <laughs> Absolutely beautiful. It's made by um, a company, the Samurai, and it's made in Japan. They are expensive. This one, I've got the details on my phone here. This one cost me £114. I've added ages and it still cuts through wood. No problems whatsoever. I mean, effortlessly, you, you just have to let the, the, the saw do the work. And it just cuts through logs, pretty thick logs. My son cut this for us. You see the size of it in my face, and he used this to cut through it. And that was my son, and he's only um, 11. So there you go. But it weighs uh, ba -do 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 -ba -do. 354 grams. Uh, it's corded electric steel, whatever that means and it measures 330 millimeters. Made in Japan with the highest technology available for cutting tools, authentic Japanese sharpening. Blah, 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 blah. High carbon SK5 Japanese steel. So uh, I'm guessing if I had a bit of flint, I think I could make sparks off this as well. So it's a multi-tool and it's got a lovely handle on it and when you when you're drawn, it's got like a, a fin finger bit where you can literally pull it. So when you pull, you're pulling there, it's pushing down. You know what I mean? But it's, it's a lovely piece of kit, like, I absolutely love it. I never go anywhere without it. So that's my samurai sword. Yeah, samurai sword. <laughs> my samurai saw. <laughs> Now I don't know if I've showed you the 12 Sagittarian axe folks. I'll show you now. There's another piece of my kit that I use. Never go anywhere without it. It's a little mini hand axe. And it is pretty razor sharp. But what I've done, I mean it's only just a cheap axe, but what I've done, I don't know if you'll be able to see that. But I've got an etching kit. I use like a soldering iron, looks like a pen. And I made some trees and some mountains on it, on the handle. And then on that side, I don't know if you can see, it's a Sagittarian. 
And yet, I made it myself. Like the, the etching and that. I done it all myself. So that's my nice little my nice little axe that I've got. I always use this. You know, chopping down limbs and cutting down dead wood. You know. Always need an axe when you're in the woods, always. I've been doing a little bit of prepping, ready. I've got some uh, pencil or marker thick sticks. Some more kindling there, pretty thick. Fine kindling. I've got some very thin fat wood. I've got the tinder box with the flint and the steel. I've got the sulphur matches and I've got the tinder bundle, bundle ready or the bird's nest so I'll show you exactly what they used to or how they made fire in the olden days using the tinder box with the sulphur matches right I'm going to try a different piece of air flint because that bit is not really much good so There you go, you can see it. Now watch. See that? I hope we're getting this on camera. <laughs> and then to pour it out, you can see. Just to pour it out, just put the lid on, some other kit. There you go. That's how you get a fire going. 17th to 18th century style. You can't beat a raw on fire, can you? So, I'm going to chill for a bit. Maybe get something to read and then um, show you how to make charred cattail. Right, I'm going to show you how to make that charred cattail. All you need is some fresh cattail and a tin with a small hole in the top. And you just want to jam all this cattail as much as you can into this tin. The more the better. I spread it out. Oh, it's messy. <laughs> Bloody hell. Right, I think I'll try and get all this in. I 
think that'll do. And then all I want to do is put it in the ash. And then what'll happen is you'll see a puff of smoke come out and we'll want to wait till the smoke is why well, basically wait to stop smoking. So in it goes. You should see it start to smoke soon. Right, you see the smoke coming out. That means it isn't saved properly, but you see it coming out the top in that pinhole. And we just want to wait till it stops smoking. Right, it's only been in about 10 minutes, but it stopped smoking. And that means it's it's charred. So I'm gonna get it out and let it cool down. Whatever you do though, do not open the tin too early because your charcoal, if it's still hot, it'll actually ignite. When well, it's cooled down, I'll pull the stick in the top. It stops the air from getting in. So let's see what I've got. Look at that. That's perfectly charred. So what I'm going to do is see if we'll take a spark. Straight away. Suffocate it so it doesn't carry on burning. So there you go folks. 17th to 18th century tinderbox. Have a go. It's not just a cat tail you can char, apparently, you can char loads of other stuff. So I think it's brilliant. Not many people know, but in this stream is our native crayfish, the protected species one. And normally when I'm here, what I like to do is chuck a bit of bacon in for them. Or, you know, some kind of meat, because they love it. Got a couple of pieces of bacon here. And I'll skewer it, stick it in for them. Such time it's left us something. How are you, lads? Oh, big my favourite. Oh, thanks, Mick. Bacon. Well, I've just been in the little boys' room and I've noticed there's mushrooms everywhere. And this, people mistake it for the chanterelle, and I'll show you how to identify them. So this is the false chanterelle, and the reason you know it's false is because if you look underneath, it has gills. Now the chanterelle, I think I'm pronouncing it right, chanterelle, chanterella, they have veins, not gills, but veins, if you know what I mean by veins. Also, the smell of almonds, they like the, the proper ones. And they don't smell of almonds. And the meat inside is white, where this is like a cream. So no smell of almonds. The meat inside is not pure white. And it does not have veins but gills. So this is the false chanterelle. Some people say you can eat it, but uh, I wouldn't. 
to be honest, it's supposed to make you ill. But some people has tried and uh, they've had like a um, hallucinogenic reaction sort of thing. So let's keep away from these. You know this folks, I don't believe this. I'm eating a curry at night and I went and left all my onions, my peppers, my shallots. All I've got is some uh, spring onion. I had a few sticks of spring onion in my bag and that's it. Don't believe this. I forgot my chopping board as well, so I've been using my, my plate. This is my, my chopping board. I always seem to forget things. I've got a bag of spices there. I might have some dried onion in there, I think. I don't know, but... Um, oh, I was looking forward to a nice curry. I think I might be able to still knock one up like so. I'll have a look what I've got. Right, and folks. Eh, uh, I've had to look through my kit. And an I <laughs> Daz especially and uh, Rob, a few of the lads, they say I always carry too much kit. But to be honest, I, I, I forgot me, me peppers and me onions and me shallots and everything. But I've went and found some dehydrated onions, dehydrated pepper, paprika powder, um some oh god, what are they called? Is it starch? Not starch. Let's help to th thicken the curry powder up. Salt and pepper. These I was automatically using in any case. Um, but I want to add like peppers and onions in. But I've got my spice box as well, which has got salt, pepper, um, paprika, oil, then I've got me steak rub curry powder dehydrated chilies so why was I panicking I can easily knock up a, a curry using this like no problem whatsoever so the only fresh that I'm using is the bit spring onion I've got <laughs> but yeah I'm happy with that like Let's get cracking with the curry. Right. Open my tin of uh, potatoes for my curry. And the old lads. And two years and um, the army will know what this is. Yep, it's a tin opener. If I can get away. That's it. Yeah, good old army kit.
a few moments later. Tell you what, folks, that is beautiful. That oh, mm. I'll put a few logs on the fire, they last like an hour or two till I drop off. Hopefully, we'll hear the owls tonight. <coughs> So thanks for watching folks, I shall see you in the next one, and remember, don't dream it, live it, take care folks.